even with his army of thousands. A battleground like this is all we need, we Iranian warriors. We have a band of seven knights, such men of name, such swordsmen, that each one of us will match five hundred, two will match a thousand, skilled cavaliers and spearmen the enemy may be. Shahnameh, Persian Book of Kings. In this episode of the series, we will look at the conditions that gave rise to the Sassanid Empire and its first king of kings, Ardashir I. We will examine how Ardashir would initiate a new way in which the Sasanian dynasty would view itself and how this view would shape the historical and world view of the Iranian peoples to the present day. We will also look at the Persian culture the Sasanians set about developing and the economics of the empire which would continue to function as the midpoint of the Silk Road trade route, bringing with it the turning of raw Chinese silk into sought-after luxury items. In addition, they would become the premier manufacturers of armor in all of Asia. 471 years ago, Arsaces, leader of the Iranian Parni tribe, founded the Parthian Empire. They had driven out the Seleucids and re-established Iranian sovereignty over these ancient lands. However, just as they had their sunrise, all empires, all regimes will also bear witness to a setting sun. For the Parthians, that would occur in the year 224. The Parthians had been weakened by decades of infighting and the incessant, unrelenting wars with Imperial Rome. Their sun had in actuality been setting for quite a while, and in its place, a new empire would arise from out of the heartland of Persia. The Parthians did not completely disappear, however. Much of their military structure and certainly their powerful noble houses would endure for some time. The Sasanian dynasty from Persia did undertake an effort to erase the Arsacids from history, even while they borrowed so much from them. To understand the Sasanian dynasty, we must go back to its rise to prominence and the reason their Persian identity would go on to influence so much of their direction as an empire. Sometimes the Shapur and Agathias inscriptions are not entirely in agreement. We know that the future first Shah and Shah, or King of Kings of the Sasanid Empire, was born in the village of Tirda, Persia, in the year 180. He was the son of a man referred to by a few variations of his name, either Babak, Papak, or Pabag. We will refer to him as Babak. His wife, the Princess Rodak, who it is speculated may have been of Kurdish origins, although we need to be careful because the term Kurdish used historically was used to refer to all nomadic Iranian peoples. The later version of the name wouldn't come into effect as a national identity until the 12th and 13th century. He also had one older brother named Shapur and several younger brothers. There's speculation in some accounts that Babak was Ardashir's adopted father, with his original father having been Sasan. Zoroastrianism played a much more central and direct role for the Sassanids than it did for the Parthians and even Achaemenids before them. Babak was a priest in the temple of Anahita. And there's also speculation surrounding the local ruler, Gucher, the king of Persis. He apparently traced his lineage back to the Seleucids. Ardashir would, in an alliance with his father Babak, challenge and overthrow Gucher in the year 200. However, the kingship would pass instead to Ardashir's brother Shapur after Babak's death. Shapur, though, would die under mysterious circumstances, for it is recorded that he would die in the collapsing structure of an old Achaemenid empire. After this incident, Ardashir would declare himself king of Persis in the year 208. He had other brothers who protested, but in a fitting display of serial patricide, he promptly had all of them executed. He would attribute his kingship as being ordained by Mazda, and indeed would be the first king of kings to openly declare his worship to the god. The following inscription from one of his minted coins reads as follows. The divine Mazda worshipping Ardashir, king of kings of the Iranians, whose image, seed, is from the gods. When many think of knights and jousting duels, the image that comes to mind is one of 
French or English knights doing one-on-one -on -one joust duels. While the Achaemenid Persian Empire had heavily mounted horsemen, it was the Parthians that really took the concept from them and then other Iranian peoples like the Scythians and developed what we now call the cataphract. The Sassanids retained the Parthian heavy cataphract, but improved on it even more. One of the aspects they retained from the Parthians was the concept of a chivalric duel. At Dura Europus, we see an example of a chivalric lance duel inscribed into the rocks. One rider knocked off his horse, another resorting to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat with both participants having lost their weapons, and a third featuring Ardashir lancing directly through the Parthian king Artabanus. It was uniquely Iranian, but blended proto-aspects of what would become European feudal chivalry and Japanese, with the selecting of opponents, for example, of equal rank to duel. The Sassanid dynasty had, under his father, received acknowledgement from the battle-weary Parthians, but Ardashir would demand notice. Ardashir knew how to create alliances and how best to squeeze the Parthian great king. He would do so by building alliances in the west. At Tessaphon, he formally rebelled against the Parthians and found supporters who eagerly flocked to his banner here and outside of the region. His defiance at Tessaphon worked because he had Persis, Susa, Aspidana, Mazin, and Germán all submit to him. This diminished the power of the Parthians at Tessaphon. However, to truly unseat the house of the Parthian Arsacids, Ardashir realized he would need to reach out to the Iranian highlanders in the northwest. In the Arbella Chronicles, it states that Ardashir and his Persian army forged an alliance with first the Medes and then the local kings of Adiabene and Karadabet Salak, the very places the ancient Aramaic speakers of ancient Assyria would meet the Iranian speaking Kurds and Medes. It was of symbolic importance to the Persians and rallied them further. Ardashir now led a mighty union of Western Iranians and was ready to face the Parthians head-on. In total, three battles would be fought, but we'll focus on the third and decisive at Hormozgan. The battle likely took place in April of the year 224. While I mentioned the armor types of each side in the last Parthian episode of the Parthian series, I'll summarize it here but elaborate on just why this was so special and why it would impact their conflict with the Romans. The Parthians wore mostly lamellar-style armor, while the Persians wore Roman-style chainmail, but much more impressive and of even higher craftsmanship. The Sassanid heavy cavalry was called the Savaran. Their combination of ring armor, plate armor, and mail optimized their protection versus the Parthians. Indeed, the Sassanids would become known throughout Asia as leaders in the field of armor craft. Based on the accounts we have of the battle and its results, we can speculate on what likely occurred. Ardashir, knowing he would likely be outnumbered, had scouted the terrain ahead of time for defensive advantages. He likely kept some of his troops hidden in the terrain, knowing he had the better armor and defensive position. When Artabanus of the Parthians entered the battlefield, it's likely that Ardashir charged and then feigned a retreat to lure Artabanus into his trap. Artabanus likely gave chase and would soon find his front line narrowing to a point in the pursuit where Ardashir's troops would stand their ground and then open an attack on three sides against Artabanus's greater numbers. Unable to effectively retreat, the Parthians were likely resigned to having to attempt to press the attack, but their numbers likely dwindled as the better armored Persians continued their relentless attacks. The Parthians would continue to fight until even Artabanus was overcome by the Persians, and victory would be Ardashir's. With this victory, the major Parthian houses offered their allegiance to his banner, as the strongest and most capable of defending their realm given the results of the battles. Ardashir would also fundamentally change the hierarchy of leadership. Under the Parthians, there was a loosely federated group of provinces, and the noble houses held quite a bit of sway over the great king. Ardashir, though, would replace this with a more centralized system of government. The moment Ardashir took power also represented a shift 
for the Zoroastrianism faith, while the Parthians had among them Zoroastrians and the Achaemenids before them spoke of Ahura Mazda, the Sassanids incorporated it into their rule. Ardashir was the first Shah and Shah to attribute his rule directly to Ahura Mazda. His new capital, built in Persis at Gur, was a magnificent circular fortified city with a Zoroastrian temple at its center. The city's circular layout was also representative of Ardashir's new concept of centralization of government. On coins and rock carvings, it's clear Ardashir directly attributed his power to Ahura Mazda. One relief at Nakshi Rastam shows Ahura Mazda handing Ardashir the diadem of sovereignty. He would build himself a castle fortress on the highest point of the plateau at Firuzabad. This provided him with a view of the mountain ridges and plain of Firuzabad. It should be stated that while Ardashir was setting about consolidating his grip on power, there was still unrest. He would lose a battle to the Iranian Kurds and their king, Madig. However, he would live to meet them in battle again, and this time crush them. Having already secured the alliance in western and northwestern portions of the former Parthian Empire, he knew he would also need to campaign in the north and east. So in the year 227, he campaigned in Makran, Seistan, and Gorgon and brought all into his new empire. Next were the regions of Balkh, Margiana, and Khorasmia, which he also annexed. Soon, the doorstep of his new empire would reach to the Indus River and would benefit both his new empire and India via an exchange of economic, artistic, and scientific trade. As for the Romans, they knew it was just a matter of time that Ardashir would turn his glance outwards and beyond the current borders of his empire. They likely knew a showdown would be inevitable, for Ardashir was bold in his claims of his family being the rightful heirs to the Achaemenid forefathers. His hope was for Iran Shah to be a pan-Iranic superstate. It was also said that Ardashir's charisma alone caused defections among many of the Roman troops stationed nearby. Troops that were already suffering from poor discipline and low morale. Ardashir felt the time was right to strike. During much of the Parthian era, the Roman response to Parthian victories was with overwhelming force. But here, with a new dynasty and leadership to contend with, it was much more cautious. The emperor, Alexander Severus, would send a letter to Ardashir in which he demanded a withdrawal. He threatened that if they did not, they would suffer the same defeats as those suffered by Parthian Persia at the hands of Trajan, Varus, and Septimus Severus. Not only did the letter fail to impress Ardashir, he would capture Cappadocia next. Severus now must have realized that Ardashir would not go meekly into the night and comply with his demands. So in response, he prepared for war by assembling a new army in Italy, yet he did make another attempt at negotiation or intimidation. The exact wording of the second correspondence is unclear. Ardashir's response, though, based solely on Greek-Roman accounts, is also up for debate, as it clearly makes Ardashir out to be unreasonable. Their account being that Ardashir's response was to send an embassy of 400 of the tallest Persians to Severus in Rome with his own demands, that Rome surrender and vacate the Near Eastern territories as far as the Aegean Sea. The Emperor Severus supposedly had the delegation arrested and sent into exile farm labor. The reason it's up for debate is that it sets up the pretense for Rome's aggression as the Emperor is painted in the light of having no choice now but to attack. However, Rome was facing its own challenges in Egypt and Syria, which had to be dealt with first. But in 231, they would come up with a plan to attack the new Sassanid Empire along three axes. One that led through the north via Armenia into Atropatene. A second that thrust across the Tigris and Euphrates into Mesopotamia. And a third, most powerful thrust at the center with the aim of capturing Ctesiphon. The Emperor Severus himself was to lead this central thrust. He was a young emperor, but in his early 20s. To finalize the plan, the Romans planned a feign by having Severus visit Palmyra to trick Ardashir and the Persians into thinking the main weight of the attack was to fall along the southern axis. 
the Roman attack in the north would prove successful. It cleared the Persians out of Cappadocia and lifted the siege of Nisibis. From there, they entered Armenia and then headed south into Media Atropatine. According to Herodian, the geography in the northwest of Iranshar suited Roman tactics and logistics with its mountainous and forested countrysides. The southern attack was making slow but steady progress as well, but had not yet reached fully into the southwest. The Romans likely felt this would be a victory along the likes of those experienced by Trajan, but Ardashir would not be so easily defeated. The Romans had also not formally encountered the Sasanian cavalry. In 233, Alexander Severus would for the first time have his troops come face to face with Ardashir's version of warfare, and it would be a wake-up call. The first full encounter of Emperor Alexander Severus's central troops with Ardashir's would come via Legio IV Scythia, who moved against Ardashir from Dura Europus. Ardashir met them on the open plains and sprung his trap of repeated attacks against the Legio until through mass attrition it was forced to retreat and defeat. Undeterred, Emperor Severus would continue his central thrust, advancing towards the target of Tessaphon, advancing to the first full encounter with the new Sasanian Savaran cavalry. Heliodorus, in his Aethiopica, described the Savaran as follows. They were arrayed in serried bands of mail-clad horsemen in such closer order that the gleam of moving bodies covered with closely fitting plates of iron dazzled the eyes of those who looked upon them, while the whole throng of horses was protected by coverings of armor. The historian Ammianus Marcellinius described the additional details. All the companies were clad in iron, and all parts of their bodies were covered with thick plates, so fitted that the stiff joints conformed with those of their limbs, and the forms of human faces were so skillfully fitted to their heads that since their entire body was covered with metal, arrows that fell upon them could lodge only where they could see a little through tiny openings opposite the pupil of the eye, or the tips of their nose, where they were able to get a little breath. Of these, some were armed with pikes, and stood so motionless that you would have thought them held fast by clamps of solid bronze. It was said Alexander Severus had hoped, like his namesake Alexander of old, to cross Iranshar to the borders of India, but like every other Roman emperor that had tried, he would be in for an awakening. The battle at Tessaphon in 233 was also detailed by Herodian. It would be a battle fought similar to their Parthian predecessors, only with their new mounted weapons and armor. On the open plain, Ardashir caught Severus and his forces by surprise and sprung his trap. His entire force of Savran cavalry and horse archers attacked in unison, a solid wall of galloping bright gleaming armor that must have tested the Roman discipline to its utmost. The initial charging weapon of choice for the Savran was their war lance. Wave after wave of them crashed into the Roman lines, which had the effect of breaking the Romans up into compact breakaway formations, which the Sasanian horse archers then pummeled with relentless volleys of arrows. Under fire from all sides, the Persians trapped the Romans like fish in a net and massacred them. Alexander Severus and a portion of his army was able to escape, but the route back to Syria would be fraught with its own perils, as his troops were soon contending with both lack of discipline and disease. The advantage of having the emperor present at the defeat for the Romans was that it could be spun as a victory of sorts, as Mesopotamia would be held by the Romans. Of course, he would fail to mention his disastrous defeat at Tessaphon. The Romans would, in response, lavish Severus with a debatedly undeserved triumph in Rome. However, Severus would in time be killed, not by the Sasanians, by his own men. Shapur, his son, was almost always at his side, whether in battle or during governance, in order to train him in kingship. Not much can be substantiated, as Ardashir's final years are clouded. There was, under Ardashir, a preference for urbanization, and new cities would be built and older ones improved, something that occurred but was not a focus of the Parthians. We also know that his efforts to centralize government and unify the new empire under the new Sasanian dynasty were mostly successful. Certainly successful enough to ensure Shapur could build on that legacy. In the year 240, 
the two would co-rule, but upon Ardashir's death in 242, Shapur would become the second Shan Shah, or King of Kings, of Iranshar, and his story continues in the second episode of this new series. I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, please hit that like button. If you enjoy the content but haven't yet, please consider subscribing. Love to have you on board. Till the next video, and as always, cheers.